Good evening. Welcome back to those who've been before, gluttons for punishment. Um, and a welcome to those who haven't been to either of my previous lectures. My name is Gwen Adsed, and I'm a forensic psychiatrist and psychotherapist. I'm honoured to be a Gresham Professor of Psychiatry this year, 2015, and next year, 2016. And this has given me an opportunity to develop some lectures on the themes of violence and therapy. And this lecture today is the last of a series of three, which I've entitled Things of Darkness. And um, this, last, this last lecture is about the treatment of violence. So what I'm wanting to do in this lecture is to think about that event that we call the index offence, which is the offence that um, we know is the one that, that people are identified by, and talk about treatment in prisons, talk a bit about, about, about how complex violence is, about treatment in hospitals and recovery and rehabilitation. So my overarching theme of these lectures has been that violence is a complex act. And therefore, the, you know, the people who perpetrate violence are a mixed group of people, that there isn't a single thing as a violent offender. And therefore, any interventions that we have, we are going to provide for people, need to be similarly heterogeneous. And I'm sort of reacting a little bit to the categorization that's implied in this lovely slide. Um, there are lots of slides out there. If you go into Google Images, you can go, you can look for lots of slides about pictures of murderers' brains and so forth. And I particularly like this slide because I think the idea of being able to put people in a category of deprived murderer and non-deprived murderer seems to me to be ambitious. Um, but I think that a lot of the research um, into how we react to violence and what we can do about violence you know, starts a bit from a problem around categorization. We also have another problem, which the philosophers among you will have identified, which is, does it make any sense to talk about treating violence? That violence is not an illness. Um, and that you know, there's a question, normally when we talk about people being ill, we want people to feel better. And we want people to be restored to, as it were, normal function. But I think when it comes to people who've perpetrated violence, we're much less clear that we want them to feel better about themselves. And it's much less clear that we want to restore them to normal function, whatever that is. And in, just, in the criminal justice system, we have a notion of retribution. And I'm not proposing to debate the rights and wrongs of that um, in this talk. But I think there's a question about the idea of wanting people who've done, the, done a victim wrong and therefore the whole of us, the society wrong, the idea that we want people to suffer and we don't want to treat them with compassion. Do, or do we want them to behave better? Because most treatments, when you go to see your doctor, you don't expect your doctor to tell you that he or she is going to give you a treatment that's going to make you behave better, to be a better person. And yet I think there is that about the interventions that we offer for violence. It's very much about getting people to behave better or possibly to be better people, which raises a question is how on earth would we know if they were better people? Now, the index offence is a phrase that criminologists and psychological therapists who work with, with violent offenders use, and it's the offence that gets people into trouble. And the reason that I've, I'm focusing a little bit just on this slide is because it's a defining offence. It's an offence that gives you an identity. Before your index offence, it's likely that you might still be a re reasonably ordinary member of society. You might have been in trouble with the law a few times here and there, but actually you may still be just a fairly anonymous person. There are some types of offence that give you an identity that's very hard to shake off. Um, and that's particularly true for things like for sex offences and especially, I think, for homicide. And one of the issues is when we're thinking about interventions for working with the violent, we have to think about what, what we want to do about this identity, what it would mean to be identified as an offender for the rest of your life. Can you ever leave that identity behind? And I had a patient who said to me, 
You can be an ex-bus driver, but you can't be an ex-murderer. And there's something here, something very profound, I think, about that question is, what are the interventions about? What are they trying to do? And this is a picture of a, any prison, but here's somebody leaving it. And the question is, is what do we, in a way, these interventions that we provide for people are really addressed very much to life outside the locked environment. And even you know, within a prison or within a secure psychiatric setting, and I'm going to be talking about both those contexts, life inside those places is one thing. But most of the interventions that we develop for people really are addressed to life outside, that idea about life after violence. So you won't be surprised to hear that there have been, there have been decades of research into interventions with, with violent criminals and the general criminals. And I think it's important when you're thinking about this topic to distinguish between violent criminals and criminals generally because, of course, only a small subsection of people who break the criminal law are violent. And there are psychological interventions that are, sort of, that are, are addressing people's general tendency to break the rules. And then there are interventions that are really geared around violence. So in terms of the, the, the amount of research that, that, that's been done, there's a lot of research and not a huge amount of output. There are a couple of key take-home messages, though. The first thing is that most offenders desist with age, that as we grow older, we become more rule-keeping and less rule-breaking. And only a subgroup of people continue to persist even into the, the fourth, and, uh, fourth and possibly even fifth decade. And... Offending is an activity of the young. The peak age for offending is in your late teens and early 20s. And only a subgroup of those will persist. A lot of young people will offend at that period of time, but then desist from offending. And rarely will they carry on into third and fourth decades. So that identity of once an offender, always an offender, is simply not true. Most people desist from offending, especially as they get older. And often they're influenced by big events in their lives, by what are called a turning point. And that turning point can be all sorts of things. It can sometimes be a jail sentence. It can sometimes be finding a really good partner, someone that you really like, and having marriage, having children, a bereavement, the death of a parent. There are life, there are life events that can act as a turning point for offenders. And a, very, and a key issue is attitudes towards agency and choice. And I'm going to be quoting quite a lot from the literature from uh, work by Tony Ward, Professor Tony Ward and Professor Shad Maruna, um, who have done a lot of work into the rehabilitation of offenders and the idea of desistance from offending. That is, rather than persisting in offending, desisting from offending. And what would it take to give up an offending lifestyle? And one of the things that turns out to be very important in giving up criminal rule-breaking and, and violence, is attitudes towards your own sense of choice and agency. That is, the sense in which that you have the ability to make choices that affect your life. And a lot of people who don't, who don't give up offending seem to experience themselves as people who have no choices at all. Most of the interventions with violent offenders start with looking at interventions that address those risk factors that we know are important in violence commission. And these are some of the factors that we know increase your risk of acting violently, of which substance misuse is probably the most important. So particularly in relation to violent offending, substance misuse turns out to be one of the most important risk factors. If we were able to control substance misuse, and reduce it, we would reduce the amount of violence in our society quite dramatically. Um, and that's partly about alcohol, which acts as a disinhibitor, but also about drugs that increase your sense of paranoia. So cocaine and amphetamines, to some extent, um, very concentrated cannabis. Any drug that really distorts your reality test in perception and tends to increase your sense of paranoia is likely to, it's going to increase your risk of being in a violent state of mind. So substance misuse work is key for working with violent offenders. Um, and most prisons in the UK will have in-prison treatment uh, interventions uh, for substance misuse. Uh, 
Social isolation and dysfunctional relationships, these turn out to be also an important risk factor for violence, particularly social isolation. So trying to get people to be more pro-social, to be, have more social connections, trying to rehabilitate people out through social structures that mean that they're connected to something is absolutely vital in terms of trying to help people um, desist from offending. Malignant masculinity and gang membership. This accounts for a, a, a only a, you know, perhaps about a third of violent crime, but a very significant type of violent crime. And there's a question to which young, particularly young men who are lost, who are socially isolated, who have no families, find a type of identity through attaching to gangs. Um, and it also gives them a type of very powerful sense of, of, of masculinity. And that's crucial, particularly for boys who've not experienced a father in their lives. There's a real dearth of role models for creative, a creative, healthy, compassionate masculinity. Those role models are few and far between, particularly in places where people are very poor and there are few job opportunities and people drop out of education. Those role models for a creative type of masculinity are few and far between. They do exist, but they're hard, they can be hard to find. So interventions that can help address the idea of, of, of malignant masculinity, more positive role models and masculine role models turn out to be very important. There are some interesting projects in the USA looking at trying to provide uh, young men in particular with more positive role models. Unempathic attitudes towards the vulnerable. Thankfully, this is probably not, a, you know, not awfully common, but it's one that I see in my work a great deal, which is people who've trained themselves, who've learnt often through adverse childhood experiences, to have very little empathy or, um, towards people who are vulnerable. And uh, looking, identifying that as a risk factor is important, and we're just beginning to try and develop some treatment interventions that are trying to help people become a bit more compassionate. And paranoia, anger and fear, helping people manage these types of negative emotions that we know contribute to violence risk. We know that paranoid mental states are a significant factor for violence risk, especially amongst people who are mentally ill. But actually, anybody who's paranoid is probably at increased risk of acting violently. And anger and fear equally. So helping people manage those sorts of feelings better becomes a crucial aspect in violence uh, redu reduction. So these are some of the interventions that are offered in prisons. And they start first with what's, what's called enhanced thinking skills. And this is the idea that many people who have offended don't really think things through properly, are rather impulsive. And that's certainly true of probably a, a very significant amount of offending, particularly property-related offending, and, and offending that takes place when people are misusing drugs. People are just not thinking very clearly. And actually, enhanced thinking skills turn out to be quite effective in reducing um, people's impulsivity, the tendency to act first and think later. Um, so most prisons will offer enhanced thinking skills programs, um, and that, no, that idea of being able to think about your own thoughts or, or metacognition. And then there are prisons that offer specific violence reduction programs. And sometimes those are general violence, so people who addressing people who've got into violent fights with other men, um, pr principally men. But there are violence reduction programs that specifically look at domestic violence or intimate partner violence. That is to say, violence that occurs only in the context of relationships and is not more general. And then we have sex offender treatment programs. These have been developed um, really based on work done in the States um, over the last 30 years or so. And these are programs usually directed um, uh, at, uh, well, really at any person who's, who's convicted of a sexual offence and serving a reasonably lengthy sentence. You only get to access a sex offender treatment program if you've committed the type of offence that will get you a reasonably lengthy sentence. So that tends to favour, uh, it tends to be offered to rapists and to um, men who offend against children who they don't know. Um, and the sex offender treatment program is again a program which is very much about looking at abnormal desires, at deviant fantasies, and the thoughts and feelings that men, and I'm talking mainly about men because the vast majority of sex offenders are male, that, sex, that men who sex offend 
the way they allow themselves to offend against people. Um, and I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. Substance misuse work I've already mentioned, and I've already mentioned intimate partner violence. So do they work? Well, there's a lot of research out there, and I'm going to show you some in a minute. And I guess it would be fair to say that there is alternating pessimism and optimism. Sometimes you can find learned articles that are very gloomy, nothing really works very much, and then you'll find much more positive articles that say, oh, yes, quite a lot of things are really helpful. And I think the evidence is fairly mixed. I think there are some interventions that can help reduce recidivism risk, um, particularly the Violence Reduction Programme and the SOTP, that's the Sex Offender Treatment Programme. Some people think that recidivism ris risks can be reduced as much as 10 or 15%. Some people say even more by 20%. But you'll notice straight away that what we're talking about here is the only measure that people really look at is the extent to which people are reconvicted for similar offences. What we don't look at is psychological change. We don't look at the extent to which you know, men, offending men, have actually changed their attitudes towards offending. And the changing factors is really complicated. I mean, we... How you look at what helps people to change is quite is, is really difficult research to do, which is partly why you know, the, there's such a, a, a mixture of views. We know that reducing substance misuse is a key factor, but actually improving literacy turns out to be a huge factor in reducing reoffending, um, and actually improving employment also turns out to be a key feature in reducing offending reconviction rates. So these are less to do with the individual person and more to do with those factors in society that we know contribute to violence risk. And in my previous lectures, I tried to set out how violence risk has to include not only individual factors, but also thinking about family, social and cultural factors. That unless you factor those things in, you, we won't really get a proper handle on violence. And there isn't such a thing as the violent person. There's a person who acts violently due to a number of factors all operating simultaneously. And some of those factors may be socio-political ones. So, for example, improving literacy and employment is, is actually a key feature in helping people not reoffend. There's also a problem with access, and some of you will know that um, there was a vogue um, in the end of the last government but one, to introduce something called um, interim protection orders in which people went to prison for indefinite uh, periods of time, particularly if they'd been violent, and they couldn't leave prison unless they'd been shown to have treatment. But one of the problems is, is that we lack the resources to offer these interventions to everybody. So the real ethical questions about how you provide the resources for these interventions, you will appreciate that some, community, some subgroups of the community feel very angry that offenders should be getting psychological interventions that help them when there are other people who haven't offended who don't get those, that don't get those interventions. And there's a very sad story from Massachusetts told by my colleague and friend Jim Gilligan of a Massachusetts prison which offered a, a literacy program to its offenders which reduced the re-offending rate by uh, something like 30, between 30 and 40%. So really a very significant fall but the literacy programme was stopped because it was felt to be unfair that the prisoners were getting something that other people who hadn't offended were not. So this is a, one of those jolly slides that you wish presenters wouldn't put up. But um, in fact, you don't need to look at anything but which side of the line these bars are. The, the ones on the right are the interventions that don't work very well. And they are interventions to do with deterrence, and, um, and sort of sanctions. Basically, punishment and deterrence don't work very well. And prison is right in the middle. It doesn't help, but it doesn't make things worse. But there is evidence that deterrence programs really don't work. So the whole idea about short, sharp shock and scare them into behaving better doesn't work, actually increases the risk of recidivism. However, all the bars on the left are the interventions that look as though they might be helpful in some way. And the interesting, the, the one that has the biggest evidence is one that's called appropriate service, which is basically about tailoring an offender rehabilitation service to the person, actually looking at what they need to help them desist. 
And if you do that, you can reduce recidivism rates in that particular program by a full 60%. And we also have interpersonal skills training, goes back to what I was saying about social isolation, structured counselling, behavioural counselling, family-based interventions come in quite high. And that's a particular issue around young offenders. Um, cognitive behavioural treatments, treatment of sexual offending actually look, comes in quite well at about 30%, although it only applies to some sex offenders. Um, that we don't have any evidence that rape offenders respond to, sex, to treatment interventions. But um, interventions for child sex offenders can be quite effective, especially when the offence is within the family. Um, again, focus, interventions that focus on the human costs of violence look as though they're quite helpful. They can change about reducing by about 20%. Therapeutic communities, too, about 20%. So that's pretty good going. And there's a quite a lot of interest in therapeutic communities in prison. And the therapeutic community is a community... Um, where but what happens is that instead of having people just being locked up in their cells and coming out and doing activities, what you have is people coming out during the day, come out and join in meetings that look at how people live lives together, that actually look at the rules around pro-social living and people tell their stories of how they came to be offenders and they examine the motivations for their offending in detail and they also look at the impact of what they've done on other people. And those therapeutic communities in prison turn out to be a very important intervention, particularly for people with mental health difficulties. Um, you'll see that boot camps only you know, do have an effect, but not very much, and scared straight, um, very little effect. And say incarceration and punishment doesn't not shown to have any effect particularly, and there, there are these sanctions and deterrents that don't seem to work at all, and say so it makes things worse. This is a slide from um, a very interesting project in Delaware which combines a therapeutic community uh, with substance misuse. And there's quite a lot of projects like this. So when people come out from prison, they join a therapeutic community which not only helps them to stop using substances but also gives them a social place to belong to. And you can see that the people who are able to complete the CREST program, these are the, uh, the purple bars, these people had much less um, uh, late future arrests compared with the people who had no interventions at all. And so that's, and that's a hugely significant distance. And that's following people up for three years. Now, three years is quite a significant period of time uh, for ex-offenders. So we really need many more programmes uh, like this. I already mentioned uh, Shad Maruna and Tony Ward, and they've been working on something called the Good Lives Model for the last 20 years or so. And they start from the position that offenders are not aliens, particularly not violent offenders. They are people like you and me. They feel like they have choices. They feel like they made bad choices. They sometimes look back on their choices and feel, how did I come to make those choices? And they want to understand how they ca came to made, make bad choices. And the Life and the Good Lives Project is about helping people make better choices in the future, working out what's important to them and helping people make better choices in the future so that they can achieve the same pro-social goods that you and I value. That these are not people who have a completely different worldview from you and me, but these are people who have used violence, used criminal rule-breaking to achieve what they wanted because they couldn't see any other way to do it. That's not an excuse in any way. Nothing about the good lives model provides an excuse. But it is trying to help people be, become more responsible for their actions, take responsibility for the choices they made in the past, and so they can take responsibility for the choices they make in the future. And it's an acknowledgement that minds can change. That, you know, that your mind is not a static thing. Your mind can change over the course of a lifetime. And that psychological therapies that help your mind change are, are going to be the things that help people try and, and change the way that they behave in the future. And many of you who know your Shakespeare will recognise this quote. This thing of darkness I acknowledge mine. And I use that quote because, uh, in the, for the whole of these lectures because a key aspect of the therapy that I've been involved in and my colleagues in the prison system are involved in, we know it starts 
with that question of taking responsibility for what you've done, taking ownership of what's happened. Because what we notice is that often when people come into prison, when they're first convicted and they come into prison or they come into hospital, they're often in a state of mind where they're trying to say that it's not their fault, that it's somebody else's problem. But we know that that is the state of mind of people who are feeling ashamed and frightened and angry and distressed. And that if we can support people enough, we can help them to give up a state of mind in which they blame everybody else but themselves and gradually take responsibility for what, they, for what they've done. So giving up the violent mind is going to mean changing distorted thinking, which is where the enhanced thinking skills comes in, changing your identity. If you've been a gang member and being violent for many years, you're going to have to give up that identity and join some other type of group, achieve a new type of identity. You've got to change the ways that people manage negative feelings. You've got to change attitudes towards the vulnerable. Many men and women who are violent are violent because they fear being vulnerable more than anything else. And if we can help change attitudes towards the vulnerable, that would probably help with reducing uh, violence. And so changing attitudes towards the self. And Shad Maruna's work in, that he published in a very, an excellent book called Making Good in 2001 was looking at how people who'd managed to give up a life of crime, how they'd managed it. And what they talked about was this sense of taking responsibility for their own choices, of being a new type of person, that there was an old me that used to make these types of choices and now a new me that make, wants to make new type of choices. And how do we support that new sense, of, it's a new sense of self, the new story you tell of yourself. But it's, say, it's not an easy process. Um, uh, this is actually a slide from the Personality Disorders Awareness Network. And, um, and actually, uh, it's a nice slide, um, and I'm very grateful to them for letting me use it. Because it is part of the process of psychological change is quite painful. Because sometimes you have to give up a way of engaging with the world that made you feel safe and superior. Um, and violence is often like that. And in order to give that up, you have to get in touch with feeling very unsafe and very um, unsuperior. And that can be quite painful. And that sense of having something taken away from you is often something that makes it difficult for people to get engaged in therapy. And I want to move to talk a little bit about the world that I know best, which is treating um, violent offenders who are mentally ill at the time of their offence. This is the type of picture that most people associate with Broadmoor Hospital, where I used to work. Um, you know, gloomy, 19th century Victorian buildings, all black and white. You can almost hear the rattling of chains. But actually, that's what it looks like. Um, it looks like um, a university campus with slightly bigger walls. Um, and, um, and on the sunny day, it's a very pleasant place to walk around. You have wonderful views over the Berkshire countryside. Um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's not the Gothic house of horror that people sometimes think it is. Uh, this is an early success story from Broadmoor. Um, this is a man uh, called, um, called Mr Oxford, who um, at the age of 19 shot an, un an unloaded pistol at Queen Victoria, Edward Oxford. Um, he was only 19, and he wasn't really able to give any explanation for why he shot this unloaded pistol at Queen Victoria, but he was bundled off uh, to Broadmoor, um, where he stayed for some 20-odd years. Um, um, no, actually, yes, a slightly less than 20 years. And all the time he was there, they could find absolutely nothing wrong with him. He was a model prisoner and a you know, nice man. Everybody said how nice he was. Um, you could see he'd been quite a pleasant-looking fellow. Um, and after about 20 years, they said that he could leave Broadmoor so long as he went to Australia. And, um, <laughs> and uh, in that long tradition of giving God's own country some of our more delinquent folk, um, we, um, we sent Mr Oxford, took himself off to Australia, where he took a new name. He called himself Mr Freeman, um, which uh, a sense of humour that would fit into his new acquired community. 
and he became a journalist and a pillar of the community and a civic, you know, upholder of civic duties and uh, married and lived a life of complete obscurity. Um, and uh, as far as we know, never got in trouble with the law again. So uh, he's one of uh, Broadmoor's earliest success stories. So what do we do um, in for treatment for violence in secure psychiatric settings? Well, we, we really build on what happens in prisons, but we also look, obviously, at the treatment of people's mental illnesses. And we look at trying to help people give up their violence risk as well as looking at their mental illness risk. So in relation to mental illness, we use the ordinary range of therapies that people use. We focus a lot on occupational therapy because we know that actually having gainful occupation of any sort really helps people in terms of their psychological functioning. Being bored and doing nothing is really bad for people's mental health. So occupational therapy is absolutely crucial for mental health recovery. Uh, medication plays a part in helping people to motivate themselves and get engaged. Psychological therapies, of which this is the work that I know best, are usually geared towards addressing not only people's recovery from mental illness, but also geared towards trying to help people who've, um, who've offended when they've been mentally ill. So we do, we, what we offer is index offence work. So we offer psychological therapy programmes that focus on the offences that people have committed. Um, we tend, and we offer both aid, individual and group therapy. And that index offence work is really because the Ministry of Justice, on behalf of all of us, want to know whether these men and women are showing remorse for what they've done. They want to know that they regret what they've done. We want to try and understand what the meaning of the offence is for these people. Because we, we think that if we could only understand what the meaning of the offence is, we could try and explore with the offenders whether the, work, the psychological work is done. If killing your mother when you were suffering from schizophrenia has great meaning for you, if we can understand that offence and what it means to you, we may be able to make sure that you don't kill anybody else who's in a maternal role in the future. Um, because you know, the, you know, the, people can stand for relationships. So we, we spend a lot of time looking at people's index offences, actually talking to them about what they did, what happened, why they did it, what were they, what were they feeling then, what do they feel about it now. And we look at how their story of what they did fits in with the other evidence. So they may have a story. Often when people come in to a secure psychiatric service, they come in with what we think of as a cover story, a story that makes them feel better about themselves, a story that the lawyers perhaps have encouraged them to think about. Um, and we look at how their story fits with the other evidence. And we also get them to think about, uh, during the course of therapy, not straight away, but during the course of therapy, we invite them to explore the impact of their offence on their families, on the communities, on their victims. Because we're really wanting to try and think about what would indicate a state of mind in which someone was prepared to give up being violent. We want to know what they really think about themselves as offenders. We want to know the real story about what happened. Um, we want to know what they think the risks of recurrence might be and who might be a target, what sort of people might be targets. Have they worked out what the combination of risk factors are? Never mind what we think, what do they think about their, about their risk? And this is another view of, from Broadmoor Hospital. This is the terrace walk, which has a most beautiful view out, out over three counties, the... Uh, 19th century architects really knew what they were doing um, and they built a most splendid uh, walkway for people um, so that people can take exercise looking out in the most beautiful view. And right at the end, not that you can see it, is a door into that building at the end of the walkway is Newbury Therapy Centre and that's where uh, Broadmoor runs a, a, a group therapy programme for all sorts of offenders. So one of the first tasks we do is to help people name what they've done to articulate what they've done. So often people start by referring to what they've done as my index or my crime. And they often talk about the people and people who've been hurt in a passive tense. Um, and I've learnt most from working with people who've killed and, they, and, and the people I work with often will start their stories by talking about when they died or when they passed away. So you can see that there's no language there of agency. It's as if the death has happened uh, to somebody else. So we're trying to move people to a place where they can acknowledge their agency. When I killed so-and-so, 
because the agency in the language reflects the ownership of responsibility. But it is painful work, and some of you will recognize this quote from a famous fictional murderer, I am afraid to think what I have done. And many of the people we work with are indeed afraid to think about what they've done. It is frightening, it is shameful, it is very disturbing. Most people like to think of themselves as good people. To think of yourself as being somebody who's done something terrible is not easy at all. So what we do is to take it pretty slowly, and we take it pretty steady as well. And uh, my much late lamented uh, colleague and, and, and mentor, Murray Cox, talked about how people move from it wasn't me to it was me, but I was mentally ill to, well, I did it when I was mentally ill to actually I did this. And that progression of agency is absolutely crucial. So we were, ran a homicide group for people who killed somebody that they knew well. Um, you'll be, you may or may not be comforted to know that you are most likely to kill or be killed by the person that you're currently sleeping with. Um, so be nice when you go home. Um, and, but also you are most likely to kill, or, or kill uh, somebody in your immediate family circle. So uh, family members, um, children, parents, partners, ex-partners. Um, these are attachments for people with whom you're in a relationship is, are, are, far, are much more at risk of homicide than strangers. Strangers, it's unusual for people to kill strangers. So in our homicide group, what we do is to explore those relationships and, and how they came to generate that, that risky state of mind. We also take very seriously the issue of pathological grief and post-traumatic stress disorder. And you may or may not be surprised to hear that people who've killed somebody close to them are at very high suicide risk for extended periods. Ten years is not unusual. Uh, for people to still to be thinking about suicide. But they get post-traumatic stress disorder too, uh, sometimes. But most of all, they need to explore their identity as a killer. And it's interesting to speculate on what it means to have that identity um, and how people reflect on a time when they didn't have that identity and the fact that they have that identity now. And we often think about them as survivors of a disaster where they were the disaster. And they have sometimes all the quality of people who've survived an experience that makes no sense to anybody else um, but, and is very hard to describe. So here are some quotes from the homicide group that I hope will give you a flavour of some of the work that we do um, with people who've killed. Um, Jim has a severe mental illness and he offers mutters quite audibly in the group. And one of the therapists said, no, Jim, I, I can't hear what you say very well when it's a mutter. And Jim suddenly said very clearly, I was thinking about the person I killed and how I'd like to say sorry. When I killed my relative, I was mentally ill. But when I killed that other person, there was no reason for me to kill them. So this is from a person, say, who's mentally ill, has established a history of, of mental illness, often presented as very mentally ill in the group, and yet is coming out with a, a, state, a statement which is very interesting, first about expressing I wish to say sorry, but also making this very interesting philosophical distinction between the killing of a mental illness where you might have no reasons to kill and killing, which might give you a reason, but an irrational reason, and the idea of killing for no reason. Because we might think that killing for no reason was actually quite mad. But Jim is making a very clear distinction between a killing in the context of a mental illness, which is a sort of reason, but having no reason and how much he would like to say that he's sorry about that. And this, say, philosophically, this statement is an extraordinary statement about agency. And here's another quote from um, a man in the homicide group. I feel I'm stuck in my previous age, the age I was when I did my offence. Time's passing here and there are things I'm not doing. I want to capture time with magazines and pictures to show what I was doing when I was here. What will it be like in 10 years' time? Where will we be? What will I think on my deathbed about this time? So here you can see somebody who had uh, committed uh, more than one homicide, in fact, um, had, ki had killed two people. And um, some people he knew very well, 
And he was, he's reflecting on time passing. Note that he can still not actually say that he killed. I did my offence, not I killed. Um, and you can see that he's thinking about what he's going to think about this in the future. But he's also very aware of the passage of time and his identity um, as someone, as a patient in the hospital. And just a reminder, really, just really how articulate and thoughtful people can be, um, even with mental illnesses and even those people with violence histories. So these are some other quotes. This is from a group which was a recovery group. So this is for people. These are, these are men, again, who've committed acts of serious violence and asking them about, being, about what it means to recover after, after violence. You have to be honest in order to go further. You've got to be honest with yourself before you can go to the doctor. This is how it is. Being honest to yourself, giving yourself a chance to breathe and grow again. A short-term step back for a long-term step, step forward. I would like to have more insight, by which I mean taking responsibility for my state of mind. It's easy to blame others for your problems. You do feel better if you take responsibility. Other things you want to fall into place, other things you want fall into place if you take responsibility for your situation. And you know, we didn't prime these guys. We just said, we, talk, we want to talk about recovery after violence. Do you want to come and sit and talk about that? So we just put them in a room with a tape recorder. Um, and they were refreshingly un, unparanoid about that. So we also have a very strong expressed wish to repair for things to be different, a wish to make reparations. If I can make something of myself after leaving here, then two lives will not have been lost and she will not have died in vain. And some people think, when I talk about this, some people think, well... He's sort of glossing over what's happened. But I don't think he really is. Uh, this is a man who killed his partner. And I think he really did feel very strongly that he had met, he'd been psychotic at the time. He was very paranoid. And, um, and he killed her in the context of paranoid delusions. And I think he really felt that if he could have a different type of life, um, then that would, to some extent, mean that he could do something different for people in the future that there would be some type of reparation, even though he couldn't bring her back. So does it work? Does, do our therapies and secure psychiatric settings work? Well, the best evidence we have suggests that it works better than prison does, that actually we have much lower recidivism rates than prisoners do, especially for very violent prisoners. However... <laughs> It's probably a little bit confounded by the fact that secure psychiatric services probably keep people for longer than they would otherwise have been in prison. Um, and they get more support and they get more supervision. And they, get more, they probably get more treatment. The other difficulty is that we do still have a significant recidivism rate because the risk persists for longer with people who have mental illnesses. There's a very high risk of suicide. Um, the, the risk appears to remain quite high for violent offending, certainly for some, for some offenders. Um, whereas for many offenders for, who are released from prison, the peak time for reoffending is in the first couple of years after offending. But actually for people who are released from secure psychiatric settings, the risk remains quite high even as long as five years after release. And that's really just about the combination of a violent state of mind and mental illness that make, my, make violence more likely. And we also know that risk increases when we move people from one service to another without adequate support. And I'm afraid that that happens um, only too frequently. So here again is another one of those slides that you wish speakers wouldn't put up, but I'm going to, just because there's, an, there's a big interest about the cost of interventions. And this is really, you, you can just see, uh, probably the, you just want to focus on the right-hand column, that these are, different these are different interventions have been offered for crime and about the benefits for taxpayers and victims. So because you might want to say, enlightened self-interest would mean that we would want these guys to get some sort of intervention because you and I are likely to benefit, even if they don't benefit at all, even if you want to say, well, I don't want them to benefit because they've been done something vile. But I guess you, you know, we would want them to change if only to benefit ourselves. Well, it looks like one of the interventions that really helps a lot is something called multisystemic therapy, which is working with young offenders and their families. 
so before they've actually committed a serious act of violence. Working hard with families, with young people who look as though they're about to go off the rails. And it looks as though an 18-month-long intervention with those families really pays off in terms of, of, of crime prevention. And the Quantum Opportunities Program is a bit like that too. It tries to identify pe young people quite early on in a criminal career and give them opportunities to work and opportunities for education to steer them away from, uh, from, a crim from criminal, criminal violence. And interestingly, the, say, the in, pri in prison therapeutic communities also turn out to be quite effective. CBT sex offender turns out to be quite effective. But just intensive supervision, that is to say, so probation, just an a probation officer meeting with someone once a week, that doesn't do very much. And actually, it looks as though it costs us more. But there are these types of, there, so you can do a really good quality economic analysis and work out which of these interventions um, actually produces um, crime reduction per, per pound or dollar. But there are still ethical questions, you see, I think, about there isn't any therapy for offenders which is quick <coughs> or cheap. Who's going to pay for it? And how are we going to pay for it? Who's going to set it up? Many offenders who come out of prison don't, can't easily access treatment programs run by mental health services. They often get rejected from mental health services for all sorts of reasons. And what about psychological therapies in prison? Who's going to pay for, for skilled therapists? And you can better believe they need to be skilled therapists. How, who's going to pay for those people to be there? And really interesting question. Is it better to give 100 offenders a sort of B-grade of therapy or intervention, which has a sort of average effect on recidivism? Or would you prefer to give 50 men a really high quality intervention, which is perhaps more expensive, that reduces their offending rates down to close to zero? And these are the sorts of questions we need to be asking ourselves as a body politic about where we want to spend our money and how we want to spend our money. Who's making these choices? It's not clear to me who's making these choices. And which of them would you choose for your son if he were delinquent? And I'm going to conclude by suggesting to you that one, another thing that we could think about doing is preventing childhood adversities. Any of you who've been to the previous two lectures and you really were gluttons for punishment will recognise this slide for its third outing. And I keep this slide because it's so important. This is a study of young offenders in a Florida juvenile prison. And believe me, those guys are not just there for you know, you know, nicking cars. These are young people, young men, who've committed serious acts of violence and have, have been sentenced to a fairly long stretch in a Florida prison. And we're looking at the amount of childhood adversity that these guys have had. And you'll see that the juvenile offenders, 50% of them have had at least four, at least four adverse childhood experiences. And, that, and then we look over here on the left-hand side that almost none of the juvenile offenders have had no childhood adversity. Childhood adversity increases your risk of being a violent offender, and it increases it in a, what's called a dose-response curve. The more childhood adversity you have, the greater your risk of becoming a violent offender. So we need to do something about childhood adversity. And I hope that it shocks you, as it shocks me, that we do not provide any interventions for men and women who are physically abusive to children. We provide interventions for men who sexually abuse children, even though there is no evidence that sexual abuse causes any, has any effect on violence risk. But physical maltreatment of children and neglect of children significantly increases risk of violence in adulthood. And yet, when we find a man or woman who's physically abused a child, we provide no interventions for that man or woman at all. And if it's a woman, she's like there, she may serve a sentence and go out and get pregnant again almost immediately. And it is absolutely startling that we do not provide any interventions for those men and women at all. But prevention of childhood adversity is something that we could do that would have a significant impact on violence. And some people think that the reason that violence rates have been dropping in Europe over the last 50 years is for two reasons. One is the more easy availability of abortion and birth control, which would have prevented young children who would have been born to lives of economic hardship and adversity, but also the decline in corporal punishment. 
that actually there's been a change in fashion. We no longer think it's acceptable to beat or hurt children quite the way that we did. And some people think, some studies in Germany suggest that that's one of the things that may have had a significant impact on violence reduction over the last 50 years. So on that note of hope, <laughs> I'm going to end. And we